So today what we are going to see is the uh, design of the tubular joints against cyclic loading. I think the last 3 4 classes uh, we were looking at the, uh, the design for static loads and as you know very well the jacket structures are subjected to cyclic loads from wave and wind to some extent and also uh, the earthquake loads in the short term it is cyclic stress reversals are there. So what is the meaning of cyclic? The load magnitude changes back and forth. If you look at a cyclic load like wave always going to have the oscillation of magnitude. So it will be having higher magnitude, lower magnitude or the magnitude can be positive and negative depending on the position of the wave on the structure superimposed. So you could see I think we, we did do some calculations on the uh, wave loading on vertical cylinders, horizontal cylinders. So if you plot with respect to time at least for one wave cycle you will see the magnitude could be positive, negative and that makes little bit worry though the magnitude is smaller it is being repeatedly applied several times that is where the, the issues. So the same joint whatever we have learned last few classes about empirical formula looking at the capacity looking at the applied loads and the ratio we try to say and conclude the joint is safe. Now that we took only the maximum amplitude of load. Now what if the same amplitude repeatedly applied several times, several times is mean is few times it is like millions of times because you are designing the structure for typically 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, 50 years. So you imagine the same wave is repeated several times and basically if you, if you take a standard wave period of say 10 seconds per year you can calculate how many times the waves can approach the structure. You can calculate the total period divided by the wave period assuming that every time there is a wave of course it would not be like this even if you go to the uh, open sea condition it is not going to be same wave every time without any calm sea condition it is not going to be that way. So you will need to find out what will be the number of cycles depending on the location and depending on the, the duration. So you can find out whatever the waves crossing the structure. So because the same loads are applied repetitively several times we need to see what effect it has got on the, the connection strength either it degrades or at what speed whether it will fail after 1000 cycles or it will fail 1 million cycles. So that is called the design against cyclic loads which is very important and it is obviously different when you compare on source structures we normally do not bother so much because the, the cyclic wind loads the magnitude is so small and you may not bother to worry too much whereas in terms of off source structural design the one major difference is design against cyclic loads which is going to cause uh, potentially problem. So we will just quickly learn since you have been introduced what is tubular joint number one how the configuration what are the uh, salient parameters like gamma, beta and the diameter ratios and the cylinderness ratios and the approach to design we learned about empirical because this complex um, behavior we could not solve by basic mechanics. So what has been done is we have a empirical formula developed based on experimental studies and then we conclude whether the joint is safe or not. Now similar approach only we are going to do but of course taking into account the applied loads and their characteristics. So what is the definition of uh, fatigue basically fatigue is a very much a localized phenomena you could see that later on we will see some animations you will see that uh, uh, you know the stress concentrations along the periphery of the cord brace interface. I think by this time you should know what is cord what is brace and the interface and the interface stresses are not uniform because the, the interface itself is not a very plain surface area you have a continuously changing profile and the load magnitude even though it is same but the profile of the stress at the interface is varying considerably and the saddle and crown I think 4 points we learned about it the previous time the saddle points are highly stressed crown points are may be slightly reduced but elsewhere the stresses may be. So you could see one potential problem is wherever the stresses are higher that is where you are going to start having problem earlier earlier than the other points. So that is basically localized and progressive it is going to be failing 
over a period of time. If you apply say 100 mega Pascal stress today and stop no more stress, it is not going to fail by failure by fatigue, it may fail by strength which we have already calculated. But if you apply the same 100 mega Pascal minus 50 plus 50, the total range is 100, but you keep changing the magnitude over a period of time say 1000 cycles, 2000 cycles, you may see that you may start to open up a crack and that is what we are going to learn about and basically those are permanent deformations. It is going to be opening up, but it is not going to close because it is already a crack. If it is within the elastic range, you may not actually become permanent because it can come back once the stresses are going to be the opposite direction. So, that is what we call it the permanent structural damage is not that we are actually making a big damage like conventionally people have a misunderstanding fatigue damage means we have a, a dented tubular it is not that way it is actually a, a connection failure by means of initiation and propagation of crack. When it can happen basically the resulting stress may be below, but then applied several times it does not mean that by this time you have a clear picture of mechanics when a structural member fail when it is becoming beyond yield that is what we have learned. If you look at the stress strain curve you just start look at the stress strain curve yielding point and then ultimate stress point and basically the any member will fail because of buckling or because of yielding because if you have a yielding that means the stress is beyond yield and it will break when the stress is beyond tensile strength or ultimate strength. Whereas, in this kind of case because we are not looking at a member we are looking at a connection the connection is one location if, if you go back and remember the stress pattern I have shown you for a T joint at uh, the saddle point it was beyond yield whereas, elsewhere the stresses are smaller. So, only one point the, the stresses may be 300, 400 depending on the stress concentration factor though applied load is only 100 mega Pascal we applied at the top 100 mega Pascal but at one point it became 300 something and when you increase the load further it may become beyond 345 which is our yield point. So, that point will start cracking once start opening up though elsewhere the stresses are very small less than the ultimate strength, but that only that particular point started to open up. So, fatigue is, is basically a mechanism by which cracks starts to develop and grow and that is exactly the idea basically grow means you today have one uh, say millimeter opening and you keep applying the loads further in a several cycles the one millimeter may become two millimeter tomorrow because the one millimeter gap which was created by the loads previously the time history is unable to transfer the load there. So, the load will go to the neighboring point and once the load goes to neighboring point that point becomes opened up. So, this propagation of crack is a very simple behavior and basically over a period of time if the crack becomes 5 mm for example, typically then it is unable to sustain any more load it may actually break away. Now, the crack only grow under the fluctuating loads I think practically if you apply if there is a 1 mm gap and apply 100 mm uh, 100 mega Pascal loading and keep it constant it does not propagate any further the problem is the propagation becomes possible only when you apply back and forth. And basically the failure generally occurs at the places where you have tensile stress you know if you have still crack and apply a compressive load it may not harm the joint altogether, but when you actually pull it off. So, that is where the problem when you have compressive stress and goes back to tensile stress starts to come out. That means, a precondition for a fatigue failure to occur is the load must be cyclic need not be just a nice sinusoidal cyclic you can actually have any pattern of cyclic does not matter whether you need to say have a sine variation or cosine variation it can have any type of loading that changes from positive to negative or positive itself the values oscillate for example, from 200 mega Pascal can go to 100 mega Pascal and then can go back to 200 and 100 does not mean that you always need to have minus 100 plus 100 you can have any oscillation. That means, you can see that there is a potential chance that this type of loading exists 
almost uh, over a long period in the offshore structures compared to onshore and we need to review this carefully. So, where the structures having potential site uh, the fatigue failure is basically the geometry makes the. So, cyclic stress is obviously there in our offshore structures geometry basically wherever the change in load path like what we have learned over uh, last few classes the tubular joints either T Y K joint or X joint and the material type depending on uh, you know ductile versus brittle material if you have a brittle material it will fail by few cycles whereas if you have a ductile material plus the connection is designed as a ductile joint then probably even the cyclic loading may not be able to fail. Size and distribution of internal defects this is the most important one when we were talking about the material selection you know the voids the welded defects weld cuts and the basically uh, the imperfections presence during the material manufacture and the welding itself we call it uh, inclusions like sulfur content that is what we are worried about when you are buying a material for the joint location we must make sure that this kind of gas porosity or non metallic inclusions because when it when they exist when the load is applied tension and compression the non metallic inclusions can become weaker and cannot transfer the load from one part to other part and straight away fail. Grind size basically this is one of the characteristics that will come from the manufacture of steel which you will learn in the next semester when we are talking about uh, the materials for structural applications you will see the grind size can be altered during the process of manufacturing that means you can do a heat treatment of the steel plates you can change the grind size grind direction that means you can have a well bonded structure of the crystal of the the, uh, the steel plates. So, basically that will affect because how it is bonded if it is well bonded your initiation of the crack and the opening further can be reduced I think you might have studied in your basic. Uh, uh, mechanics body centered versus face centered uh, crystalline structure for steel. So, depending on the structure you could see that the opening and the rate at which it is going to open though there is an initial crack it may change. So, basically that is something that we can control during the manufacture of steel itself if you can control that you can reduce the susceptibility to, to crack and fail by fatigue. Environmental conditions basically uh, you can see the temperature is most important the higher the temperature you could see the change in characteristic of steel and basically also affect the corrosion rate I think we will be learning little later corrosion rate could be higher when the temperature is higher. And both of them also have sometimes the corrosion induced fatigue is, is a potential problem which is a specialized subject which may not actually directly be accounted in our calculation just now, but sometimes we do calculate because of corrosion you may have additional uh, fatigue failures. A typical uh, picture of a butt joint and a fillet joint you can see here the problem is not only the weld the near vicinity of the weld where the crack can exist during the welding itself just what we were talking about the, the other day during welding because of the high shrinkage starts to build up the stresses and if the material is not good enough instead of welding crack you may actually see the crack near the vicinity of the weld itself which we call it uh, the heat affected zone where the material will show a crack. So, when you apply loading back and forth few times you will see that the, the depth of crack can actually propagate and by the time when it becomes unable to sustain for example, 10 mm plate you have a crack of 5 mm almost the total load is applied through assuming your design is for 10 mm, but now the load will become double here. So, what you will what you will see as the crack depth increases the speed at which it is going to fail it will, it will be just exponential because the load growth over the remaining thickness is going to be higher very easy to understand is not it. So, basically initially maybe 1 mm 90 percent of the thickness is available to transfer the 100 percent load whereas, when it becomes 5 mm 50 percent thickness is available, but the load is still 100 percent nobody is reducing the load. So, what will happen is the rate at which it grows to become very fast. So, that means there is a threshold when it is 2 mm may be still okay 3 mm 4 mm 
may be higher, but after 5, 6 mm you will see that the failure rate or the rate at which it is going to just propagate is going to be very fast and suddenly you will see that disaster. So, that is where that threshold is something that we need to find out, so that we can allow up to say 2 mm or 2 and a half mm beyond which we should restrict. That means, if there is a margin of safety over your 100 mega Pascal design, whatever you are applying load, then you can decide that basically what is the limits of the faster crack growth. But unfortunately, this crack initial will not be known to you during the design process. Nobody is going to tell you, I am going to fabricate your structure that you are designing with 1 mm crack. Nobody have idea about fabrication because the design stage is earlier than the fabrication stage. That is one of the problem in the whole business of this fatigue design, we could not actually design according to the reality. We will later go through few of the methods available, you will find that we are doing something um, not exactly happening in the real picture. So, this basically you can see this left side picture is one of the joint butt welded, but you can see the crack just at the, the tail or the toe end of the weld you can see a crack almost have gone through the full thickness of the plate. In fact, it is almost failed. Similarly, you could see the microscopic cracks just beneath the weld, which actually when you see a visual inspection, you may not see any cracks, but actually there is a inside crack and if you do a NDT only, you will be able to find out this, because they are inside and when you apply loading you will see that this initial crack or the inside crack can start propagating and will only appear to the surface after several cycles of loading. Initially you will see the joint is very intact and later after few, maybe one or two years you will see that the crack is appearing, but by the time you take any remedial action the joint will fail because the internally cracked will not give any notice to for you to decide and make any repair. At least the external ones you could easily see initial time and start making repair. So, typically fillet weld also have susceptibility similar like this. Of course, you may also have a, a initiation of crack at the root end of the weld. You see here, what happens when you have a plate like this? Hope all of you are able to see what is the difference between the penetration weld and the, the fillet weld. Fillet weld is not fusion, it is just only connected at the, the two sides of the plates. So, when you apply horizontal load to this plate for example, the weakest point is basically the junction of the two plates at this point and that is where you will start pulling your the base plate and when you apply horizontal load and that is where the initial crack in, in fact will start to appear because the weld will start to come out. If the weld is stronger, the neighboring plate or the neighboring surface will start opening up. So, you will see that these scenarios are only an assumption. In reality, all depends on several parameters like plate, plate thicknesses, ratio of plate thicknesses, the size of the weld, quality of the weld and so many parameters will come in. So, this is what the picture I would actually wanted to talk about basically the, the crack size propagation versus the cycles. So, you can see in the initial time it goes almost flat slow and when you reaches the threshold somewhere here you can see it is going very very much vertical that means after reaching certain stage you will see that the failure rate will be very fast and in no time you will see that the crack is almost disjointed. So, the rate of crack growth is proportional to the square root of its length. So, the longer the length that you grow the rate at which it goes is going to be higher. So, that is the uh, basically in terms of square. So, if you have 1 mm slow, 5 mm 5 square. So, basically that is the, the rate at which it is going to grow is going to be exponential. <coughs> cracks remain very small and very hard to detect. We are not looking at cracks that are uh, visible. You know if you, if you look at welded joints, you cannot really see these are micro cracks. Those one what you see here is basically almost visible cracks, but not every joint is going to have visible cracks. You will see micro cracks, these are magnified cracks and basically in the real pictures or real uh, actual welded joints, you may not even see any cracks at all, but there are 
uh, micro cracks that may exist between the weld surface and the base metal surface if the fusion has not taken place because typically you just weld it and the weld metal has been deposited but there is no fusion between the weld metal and the base metal and you will see that you may see everywhere it is in contact one or two spots may have a small uh, non contact surfaces and that is where you will start because for crack to propagate you do not need everywhere crack one point is good enough so that it will start from there and propagate and then fail. In this I think this is what we were talking about the minimum crack size and the admissible crack size and finally failure occurs. This we need to decide depending on the design how much we can allow depending on what type of joint. So, basically the admissible crack size is something that is very hard to decide because there are numerous numbers and types of joints that we have and basically that is where the fatigue design becomes complex. In fact, as early as 30, 40 years back people were trying to do design based on this crack uh, size acceptability. Can I accept half a mm? Can I accept 0.1 mm? But unfortunately the, the acceptance criteria itself is a big variation because so many different types of joints and there is no specific data available that if you accept a 0.1 mm that the joint is going to be safe because there is no such um, information available from the, the databases or from the past study. But at least there were uh, several studies done over the last uh, so many years that crack propagation is a problem and have sufficient number of publications to come up with today if the crack is 1 mm maybe after several years the crack may become say 2 mm. So, such experiments have been conducted, theoretical formulations have been uh, proposed and compared and some theories exist that we can predict if you know what is the crack today you can actually find out the crack growth over a period of time. So, such theory do exist, but the one problem is what is the crack today or the initial crack even before you start fabricating the jacket because your design is done prior to your fabrication. So, basically that is where the, the whole methodology looks seems to be good idea is good, but the design process becomes difficult. We will see what are the disadvantages before we go into it. The crack growth depends on uh, typically if you see this picture uh, miniature crack is introduced in between uh, metal piece applied with uh, cyclic stress some magnitude. So, when you up keep applying back and forth what will happen is this crack will start extending beyond its original size of 2 a. So, basically uh, that means if you just calculate across this nice cross section here the stress will be yes is not it because it is a simple axial stress. But when you go across exactly at the middle depending on the opening of the crack what will happen the stress intensity especially at the vicinity of the this tip you know that location you will see a increased stress. Of course, if you do an average stress the basically the total load divided by the reduced area the area is reduced by 2 a times is not it because original width may be b, but the reduced width is b minus 2 a. So, obviously average stress could actually increase across this point and across this point, but at the point of the, the convergence of the crack to a single location it is a singular point you will see the magnitude of stress could be very large few times that we call it the, the stress intensity increase or sometimes we call it stress intensity factor because then you can multiply that factor with the, the nominal stress applied elsewhere or at the far away point. Now, this intensity factor depends on few parameters and basically one is the geometry this we have taken a nice flat plate with a, a elliptical shape. Uh, crack opening and basically and also depends on the magnitude of stress for sure what is that stress that you are applying and square root of pi multiplied by half of the. So, this is the proposal as early as 1960s given by Paris and uh, he has proposed a formula to calculate the rate of crack growth depending on uh, the geometry and depending on the magnitude of stress he proposed this equation basically the, the crack size increase d a by d n with respect to number of cycles uh, 
is a constant multiplied by the stress intensity factor which is basically the difference between the magnitude of positive stress to negative stress which is basically k max minus k min which is again either you can define in delta term or in the real term you know what we are looking at is the change in magnitude of stress does not matter whether you are you are writing in k or delta k we are looking at the shift from one side to other and to the power n. Now, this c and n is basically to be found out based on type of joint, type of connection, type of welding and basically have to experimentally do this. That means, you fabricate a joint, take to the laboratory and uh, put it in a cyclic testing machine, apply and repeat the test and from the regression analysis, you can find out the characteristics for that particular joint. So, you will do few of them and plot the results against and you find out the c and n values. So, basically quite a lot of experiments have been done uh, as early as 1960s and 70s. This equation seems to have uh, actually coming from those uh, studies, constants have been performed or calculated for particular type of material, particular type of joint and from here only we are actually going to progress further. Uh, in fact, all our modern fatigue analysis we are going to use this equation only thing is how we use it is going to be slightly different. Of course, this delta k which is called the stress intensity or uh, SIF factor depends not only on those geometry, several other parameters which are actually described as k 1 up to uh, the last one which we were discussing about the stress multiplied by root phi a. You got surface effect, crack shape, what type of crack and the finite width effect basically we are looking at the local surface effect, stress gradient across the plate thickness. Basically, if you look at this plate, whether any variation, this is one an example just we assumed that the stress is across the thickness is uniform, but in real picture in real uh, joints, you will have variation of the stress across the thickness. So, quite a number of parameters will come into picture and ultimately all of them together is basically the, the geometric fact. When you do this, when you actually integrate this equation, the number of cycles for a crack to grow from a i to a final can be taken from the basic equation which was described by Paris growth law. So, just uh, reverse it and integrate. So, you will see that the crack size from initial to final is proportional to the initial crack d a and basically divided by the the parameters which is c and n and also the delta k which is your the stress intensity at the joint or at the location. And this is the equation that we actually will see later on transformed into a SN curve. So, the final size of the crack can be calculated you substitute back the initial size and integrate the equation you will find k c is the, the toughness of the material basically come from the coefficients c and n, which several tests are available to find out the value of k c. Uh, basically, one of the tests that we do is the, uh, the fracture toughness test, which some of you might have seen in the laboratory. Uh, basically, what we do is we make a initial crack of a particular shape and then place the specimen in a machine and try to impact on the back side, whether it will fail or it will intact. So, basically we can find out the fracture toughness in a char p v notch testing machine. Some of you might have seen in a mechanical lab or strength of materials lab. And basically just uh, the rewriting of the same equation which we saw earlier here in terms of delta term basically the differential uh, between the k max and the k min. Now, when you, when you look at this equation, what we are looking at is the fatigue life, number of cycles to failure from an initial crack to a final crack, which is of our interest. If you take the design life is 25 years, you convert that into number of cycles by knowing the wave period. Now, if you have one constant wave period, you can find out the number of cycles, but if you have multiples of periods, so you need to find out the summation and then divide from the total time period you can find out the number of cycles. So, basically number of cycles is proportional to basically the total time the structure is supposed to be designed. Now, you can rewrite that same equation in terms of uh, basically what we are trying to do is take out 
the d a is kept there y a because we are going to substitute the values of if you look at this equation delta k we are going to substitute the delta k as the geometric parameter stress range and then root of phi a you substitute here and you will get a different constants basically that is what we are looking at the number of cycles the stress range from here it has been taken off after integration to the power m instead of n just a notation change just to give you an indication and on the left side is basically is going to be the joint dependent and the starting crack dependent. So, as long as you know what is a starting crack and you can find out the final crack knowing the stress applied and the number of cycles that you are going to apply and C is a constant depending on the type of material and the type of joint. So, as long as you know these parameters the relationship between the stress applied number of cycles that you are going to apply will be a typical constant for a given joint. Now, we can rewrite this whole thing by doing the integration. So, you can write this way and basically this number of cycles and the stress range that you are going to apply for a particular joint is equal to this much. Now, m is the slope of the S n curve that we normally have defined later on we will we'll come to know. So, this integration basically the equation is coming from nowhere other than the, the Paris crack growth law. And the problem is now we can solve the equations here as long as you know all the parameters. For example, if I know the initial crack which is a i and we can calculate the final crack and we know what is the acceptable crack. If you have say 0.1 mm is the acceptable crack, you substitute here that will be the final crack and basically you know the stress you can find out on what number of cycles this a final will happen that is what our intention. Our intention is we want to limit to 0.1 mm and we know what is the number of cycles. So, we can just calculate back and then say whether the joint is, but unfortunately all these parameters like initial crack and final crack we do not have information and that is why this method is not going to work for us. So, we need to look for alternative methods by somehow, but what we know is we know what is the number of cycles going to be applied, we know what is the stress levels going to be applied with that information the right hand side cannot be computed because we have a lack of information. So, we are going to have a alternate design methods which somehow we need to decide whether the joint is safe or not. Now, whatever the equations what we have seen here is called the method based on the fracture mechanics or crack propagation theory. And this method is as early as 1970s people have devised this is the equations what you are seeing, but unfortunately could not practice in the design because of the lack of information and basically so far whatever the fatigue design we are making in the uh, real industry whether it is mechanical industry or offshore industry or onshore we still use a hypothetical design method which we are going to describe over the next slides. So, basically what we, we try to do is we do an indirect method of design basically we know what is the number of cycles applied, number of cycles to failure needs to be obtained from the equations that is now what we are seeing. And we need to see that the cumulative behavior because 1 mm today can propagate to 2 mm. So, that means 1 plus whatever is happening over the period of time. So, it is every time it is getting added up. So, that means we need to find a methodology by which you can cumulatively add the effects over a period of uh, design life. The number of cycles we need to find out by some means. Now, by this time I think you have you have got some background to hydrodynamics from a random wave we have decided to convert to regular waves and from regular waves you can find out number of repeated cycles of the regular wave and you can compute back, but all of those assumptions are going to be highly influencing the fatigue design because you are going to make lot of assumptions. That means, basically if you go back to the nature and try to simulate a, a real random wave, you could actually find out the probability of exceedance. Whereas, in the fatigue design what we are going to make, we are going to convert the probabilistic problem into a deterministic and try and figure out how many number of cycles that may occur. But in the recent times, people are actually devising a method based on which you can do a probabilistic fatigue analysis, which we will go into the tail end of this course, we will try to do a 
simple simulation. And the material behavior, some material behave basically very close to fracture quickly or some material. For example, if you take uh, aluminum, steel and rubber, you will see that these three materials going to behave differently. One of them may fail early for the same type of loading, same magnitude, number of cycles same, one of them may fail. So, which one will fail earlier? For sure, you will see aluminum, steel and then you can see rubber. So, based on the material structure, you will see that it is going to affect, it is not only the strength, but what is the type of material that you are using there. You will see the characteristics of loading itself, whether high magnitude, low number of cycles or low magnitude, high number of cycles, which is another important parameter. For example, if you go to sea state conditions, is large number of cycles, magnitude can be smaller. For example, if when we are designing a structural member, we normally look at the high stress, the maximum wave load that may occur during the life of 25 years and design it, but that may occur one time, two times, maybe few times over a 25 years time or 50 years time, whereas the smaller waves is going to occur very often, but the magnitude could be very small. Typically, if you, if you, look, if you remember the allowable stress for a member, we were talking about 60 percent of yield strength. If you take a high strength steel of 345 mega Pascal, 60, 60 percent will become how much? 200 mega Pascal. Now, 200 mega Pascal applying three times versus 10 mega Pascal applying millions of times, which is going to give you problem. For sure, you are going to get problem with the, the high cycle, low magnitude. So, that is where the fatigue going to propagate. You apply 200 mega Pascal and maybe two times, propagation becomes not going to go further because after applying, it will just come back. So, that is why what we are interested is the high cycle fatigue, which is almost similar characteristic for offshore structures. Take a typical example to understand what exactly is going on. If you take a simple uh, jumbo clip, I think most of you might have seen, no? You take and try to open and close, if you, if you see in the uh, office. So, you take the angle of opening basically you open lower and repeat, will take longer or larger number of cycles and opening bigger. I think most of you have seen the clip now, you can try to break yourself and if you open 90 degrees and back and forth. So, you can see the relationship between the number of times that you need to open close versus the angle, you will see that the 90 degree is taking less number of cycles, so a typical example and the smaller the thing. So, that means the lesser the effort, more number of times you have to do it, more the effort you can break it. In fact, if you make it 180 degrees, you can break it faster, is not it? So, it is a simple idea that means you need to get into your mind lesser the effort or lesser the stress, number of cycles could survive more. So, exactly vice versa, the magnitude is larger, then it can fail by. That is where when you are trying to break something, you actually apply more effort, so that you can break it very quick, is not it. So, that is I think that idea you should keep it in your mind, the fatigue is a phenomena related to two things, material is one, the other one is the characteristics of loading, whether you are applying high stress, low cycles, low stress, high cycles. So, typically you can see here the mild steel versus aluminum, aluminum fails earlier. Of course, one important thing is the aluminum is becoming slightly ductile. You may not even fail when you apply the stress below certain range. That is one characteristic is typical for each material. You know, for example, you take the same clip, that jumbo clip, but you apply a feeble effort, small, very small, lazy, but you apply as many times as you like, it will never fail. If you go back, for example, instead of 10 degrees, you apply only 1 degree opening small and that is how you normally use a jumbo clip, is not it? That is why it does not fail, but somebody is going and opening for 30 degree, 40 degree, after few times you will see that the clip is broken and that is exactly, if you apply 1 degree or half a degree every time like a normal use, you may see that it will never fail because the number of cycles 
are such that very large does not matter because the effort required to open a small crack does not happening, it is not there and that is where you will see that some of the material even if you if you have infinite number of cycles, but the effort is so small or the stress is so small that the initial crack opening will not happen. So, that is called the endurance limit, the limit of the material by which it does not actually initiate or propagate a crack and each is this is very specific to each type of material like steel, aluminum and other types of in fact, if you go back to steel itself various materials are available with the different alloy components you will see that the endurance limit is going to change. So, that means you see here at this point after this point after 10 power 6 cycles you increase as long as the stress levels are below 38 mega Pascal does not matter you do not need to worry about fatigue as long as your stress level go beyond 38 mega Pascal then you start to open the crack. So, this needs to be uh, clearly understood as long as you can keep the magnitude below then the fatigue becomes not a big problem. A typical uh, K joint which I think most of you are familiar you can see from here we could easily understand the most problematic points are problematic points are the, the saddle and the crown points because that is where the magnitude of stresses are going to be higher. So, where the fatigue will come basically you have a tubular connection like what we have seen for few classes thickness transition I think also a potential problem where the concentrated stresses are going to be there and many many different types of plate connections T junctions or butt junctions. So, for a fatigue to occur I think we have got now clear understanding discontinuity the load, load path or stress path and basically thickness change and the load must be cyclic. So, these are some of the prerequisite you may actually have got idea now that a fatigue propagation or fatigue failure may happen if you have some of them or, or combination of them. There are several types of fatigue that we may actually have to deal with in the offshore business. The most important and the critical one what we normally talk about is the wave induced fatigue that means the loads are applied to the wave the structures directly that means you have a fixed installation the waves are coming and interacting with the the structures directly that means the wetted surface is on the member itself and evaluate the forces evaluate the fatigue directly. Second one is the wind induced fatigue similar except that instead of wave you have a wind forces I think in the earlier uh, sessions we were talking about the cyclic wind this susceptibility of a cylinder structures. The third one is the, the interesting one the structures are above for example, you take a ship or uh, other hulls where the structures are located above water, but then the structures are having response to the wave because of the hull is moving. For example, you take a FPSO I think you have seen some pictures I have shown you earlier you have a ship shape hull, but the structures are all located on top of the ship itself there is no direct contact of waves with the structure, but the waves are interacting with the ship and the ship is responding to the waves in terms of motion basically heave, pitch and other response characteristics. Because of the motion what will happen the structures are subjected to inertia based loads and that inertia based loads will cause fatigue because it is also cyclic as you know very well I think most of you might be doing the uh, the dynamics course statics and dynamics course you will see that this whatever the wave loads are attacking these floating structures you will see a period of motion depending on whether it is roll or pitch or heave you will see that they are going to be cyclic and that motion loads will induce fatigue on the same connections which will actually be more uh, problematic because you need to now include the response of the hull itself whereas earlier the structure is fixed and we assume that the structure response is small. So, we use a direct wave calculation and the stresses whereas here you need to find out the response of the hull and then transfer the response of the hull to the structure and then calculate the stresses. The next one is the load induced fatigue basically there is no wave, but we have a load changing with time for example, you take a crane sometime you do a lifting of an object 
and leave it. So, you see every time when you do a lifting, what happens? The stress goes to say compression on one side, tension on other side. When you put the load back, the crane is unloaded. So, at that time, you will see that the stresses goes to reversal. So, after several cycles of loading, unloading, you will see that there is a. So, such kind of fatigue may also happen. Vibration induced fatigue, these are something very uh, important for uh, machineries and machinery support structures, which are uh, uh, sometimes problematic in terms of uh, offshore structures. Basically, you have turbines, cast power producing machines, compressors, many times becomes serious issues. So, basically, whenever you have a vibration, the structures are going to oscillate and you will see that the connections at which place is restrained, you will see the, the cracks. The last one <coughs> basically because of again vortex induced vibrations, some of you might have studied in your fluid mechanics, vortex formation and setting is a very, very critical character depending on the flow and the size of the structure, can cause cylinder elements to vibrate and can cause fatigue. So, we need to look at those things, but this fortunately is not due to any of the loads which we have described. It is due to steady flow like wave uh, like current and wind. You know most of these we might thought that there is no fatigue because steady flow does not cause oscillating forces, but this steady flow causes vortex and that vortex has got the unequal strength in both directions in line and cross directions can cause vibration and that vibration can cause additional failures. So, these are some of the areas where uh, individual uh, fatigue evaluation has to be carried out depending on their magnitude. One may assume a higher magnitude for example, wave induced fatigue and a jacket is higher whereas, vortex induced fatigue may be very critical for a riser, wave induced fatigue may not be a uh, problem. So, you need to see which type of fluid structure interaction problem and have to quickly look at which one is going to cause trouble and decide and then evaluate. It is not that every one of them happening for every one of the structure that you are going to design. For example, motion induced fatigue, it will be problematic only for FPSO type of hulls and structures, there is no direct wave loading. 